today. And I'm also welcoming you on behalf of Smriti Rani from Palim India, who's unable to join us this morning. I have my co-facilitator, Sunita Daniel, who's going to wave at you just now, I think. Yeah, there she is. So we're delighted as people are still joining, uh, but we're delighted to have you uh, on this course this week. Please see the note that uh, Arun has put on, which is reminding you of how you can get a certificate. So 70% attendance, filling in the pre and post questionnaires. Uh, we'll post that on, on uh, the chat a couple of times for those joining later. If you haven't done your pre-questionnaire, this is just the moment to do it as we're about to start. This course has been running for several months and we have been so encouraged to really build a community of practice, people who are wishing to explore how to integrate palliative care principles into the management of, of those with COVID-19, but also to look at the bigger picture of palliative care integration. Thank you for being part of today. We can see when we look through uh, the details that there are um, colleagues who are working in palliative care and many who are not. We have people representing nine states in India coming on the call, 54 all together. We have colleagues from Bangladesh, from Indonesia, from Nigeria, from the Philippines. I definitely have seen our Philippine colleagues uh, joining us already and one person from the UAE which, who is booked into coming. Please tell us who you are and uh, as we begin to start the course, Sunita will be helping us think through how we can interact and how we can work together. I'm a palliative care physician uh, trained in Scotland but I've had the privilege of working for more than 30 years in palliative care and for many of those years, 20 of those years, working alongside colleagues in India but also based uh, for a significant time over the last 10 years in McCary University in uh, Uganda, as well as working in the Middle East. So I'm particularly delighted to be with you today. And I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Sunita, who will get us started. Thank you, Sunita. Uh, thank you, Moira, and thanks to Pali Media team. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, this, I believe, is our 12th session, 12th week of the Pali COVID Echo series, uh, which has been going on uh, since April 2020. Um, so basically, what we're, uh, this is part of a resource toolkit, which uh, Moira would be going in detail uh, when she does a session, introduction session, but this is one of the resource toolkit, and we hope to make it uh, quite interactive. So I just want to introduce you to all this of, of, of the functions that is available to you uh, as participants uh, using the Zoom platform. Um, so if, if you, the most important one is a chat function. So if you can uh, scroll down to the bottom of the screen, you can see the chat button where you can enter your questions um, and please feel, feel to use that because we hope to make this a very interactive session. Um, you would have all received the full link for the resource toolkit already, which has got the webinars. And uh, what we have done is each of the five sessions um, will be based, is based on the webinars. So once, if you've already uh, seen the webinars, it'll be, it'll be more interesting and be more interactive when we use a session. So we all encourage you to, um, you know, see the webinar before we start the session. And... Um, you know, and again, before we start, please uh, introduce yourself in the chat and uh, hopefully we'll make it uh, interactive, uh, ask, uh, uh, you know, ask questions and also think about a scenario. So this is a, this is a Pali COVID echo session. So what we're trying to do is to uh, introduce um, and also to discuss about the experience of Pali Tika and how Pali Tika is important to the COVID-19 scenario. So we've got people from different countries um, and different um, healthcare settings uh, and uh, different uh, professions. So so what is your experience um, as a healthcare profession or as a person? Because as we all know, COVID-19 is, is, has affected all of us. It's a global phenomenon and uh, it's, it's affected the whole, whole of us in different ways. So feel free to put anything about COVID-19 um, uh, professionally and personally in the chat box. And um, you know, this is like a continuous session. So today's course doesn't end here. We're going to meet you again tomorrow and the next a couple of days. So it's like a five days of interactive session. Where hopefully we can uh, discuss the current scenario as well as learn from each other. And um, so far, as, as I mentioned, this is the 12th session and uh, all of us was, uh, as faculty has learned quite a lot. 
uh, and uh, you know ha has been a, an interesting journey since it all started. So welcome to you all, and um, I would like to again welcome and uh, a huge thanks to Dr. Moira Lang. She has introduced herself, but I also say that she's a very good friend of all of us in Kerala, and she's got more than 30 years experience uh, working in palliative care. She's an internal medicine, medicine specialist um, and a physician from palliative care in UK, and she's worked in more than four continents, including UK, India, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, and she's been uh, such a support to all of us in India and Kerala. Over to you, Moira. Thank you so much. That's very kind. I didn't know you were going to say that, Sunita. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing the slides, but as I do, three things. If you haven't told us where you're from, please do. And, and I'm loving seeing all the names come up here. Secondly, start to think of what you want from this course and start to put that down in, in the chat. And thirdly, what is palliative care? You've come on a palliative care course. Some of you, this is new. Put down what you think. And in a few moments, Sunita will collate that chat. But let's uh, start. Here we go. So we've already introduced this. This is a course that is adjunct to or, or, or um, complements the uh, resource toolkit. We're hoping to train and empower you. If you already have a lot of experience, please share that so that that training and empowering is mutual learning. We're going to think about patients who are COVID-19 positive, particularly those with comorbidities and how that impacts on our care for them and also the needs of the wider community and healthcare workers. As Sunita has already said, this impacts us all. We have a number of competencies. These are in your materials, so I'm not going to read them, but they fit along these five domains. Now, these domains have been identified by the expert group that developed this, but also um, confirmed by other publications I'll mention in a moment. So issues around triage, decision-making, ethics, communication, very important and perhaps quite tricky. And today we'll think particularly about triage and decision-making. Issues around symptom control, particularly the common symptoms faced and the medications, uh, we will need to meet those symptoms. Management of distress, and then we're using the term distress to talk about the psychosocial and the spiritual aspects and grief and bereavement, very important. Of course, end of life care, it's, it's an important component of palliative care. And we'll think a little bit about settings of care. And lastly, as as healthcare workers, how do we support one another to be able to continue to offer compassionate care and avoid burnout? Please do use these resources. And um, the more you're able to come to these sessions, familiar with some of the concepts, the better an experience you will have. We're going to be signposting a lot. Um, so if you come in from another area or if you feel you're not getting the issues you want, for example, I can see there's pediatric colleagues. We're going to be signposting for you specific resources um, from pediatrics. In fact, I may ask um, Sunita to do that quite soon because the International Children's Palliative Care Network are updating on a weekly basis uh, any resources relating to pediatric palliative care. This, these sessions will stay a little general, but we can go in directions that you want at your request. This week is in English and we've already mentioned the rest of this. Flip classroom, by the way, for those of you who want to know, means that the theory is there in a webinar and the session we have together is more designed for interactive learning and of course for review of the theory. You can then use this material. Uh, some people have asked for translations in Bangladesh, for example. I see someone from Bangladesh has been translated into Bangla. Um, and you can also use some of this material to do CMEs in your own setting in due course. And very importantly, we've produced disease uh, management algorithms. Please familiarize yourself with these, ask us questions, make sure you're feeling com comfortable about using the relevant algorithms um, as we go through the sessions. And if you want to adapt them for your own setting, please let us know. So I don't know, Sunita, did we have any answers to what is palliative care? Not so I far, think no. As yet, just, they weren't coming through. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. We have one now. Okay, yeah. so palliative care is to relieve suffering, and COVID 19 is associated with a lot of suffering. 
exactly yeah yeah so i asked them why do you think it's you they think it's important in, in covid 19 so this this um again i'm going to um take what moira is going to say there's a tsunami of suffering so palliative care is really suffering very good great and keep those ideas coming you, i know you're just getting used to this and sunita will keep you right on the chat okay so we have a new term that we came up with a few, a few years ago as part of a, a Lancet Commission report, which talked about serious health related suffering, and it's a helpful term. And palliative care is holistic, active care, active being very important. Uh, sometimes people think of palliative care as giving up. I don't know if any of you thought that, but it's the very opposite of that. It's very active care, which is given across the age spectrum for anyone with serious health related suffering, particularly at the end of life, but not only at the end of life, focusing on quality of life, on families and their caregivers. And we're going to pick out some of these issues as we go along. If you have ideas or thoughts about palliative care, do tell us. And if you have questions, also do tell us. We're in a humanitarian crisis, and as Sunita said, this is affecting us all. Interestingly, we have been looking at, those of us in, in palliative care specialties, how we intersect palliative care with humanitarian settings. You see in these pictures the Kerala floods, the Nepal earthquake, and this is a refugee um, migration of huge numbers in northern Uganda, where I've been working. We have guidance to help us, including a Lancet uh, outline, but still people tend to see palliative care in this top way as for hopeless cases. And I, I think what COVID-19 is teaching us all is how do we integrate? How do we make sure that everyone has these skills and they're not simply with some uh, specialists? This term tsunami of suffering, uh, I think is very helpful. And this is an excellent article by friends of ours. Uh, these stats, my apologies, are out of date, of course, now, but showing what are the important domains for palliative care in this uh, international paper, and they fit with what we chose. Communication, uh, symptom control, psychosocial and spiritual care, end of life care, and staff support. And when we come to management, we're thinking particularly of those for whom disease uh, treatment escalation is not likely to be helpful. We also do, th and a great big thank you to WHO, we do have some helpful guidelines now that include palliative care into the management, disease management uh, documents. Um, these might, this might be very useful in your setting in terms of adv advocacy and planning. And they have identified, I think, also very helpfully, some of the vulnerable populations that are at risk. And for two comments from the give... uh, audience, so the yes. holistic care yeah. for patients and families. Uh, Mariana said that before you mentioned that, uh, Moira. And also Adelina has said uh, it's a care that transcends beyond curative aspect, but holistic care providing relief mm -hmm. of suffering of patients and their families. Thank you very much for the comments, uh, both of you. Wonderful, thank you. So looking at some of these vulnerable populations, this is a, a beautiful award-winning picture, but of Rohingya children in the camps and that refugees, particularly those in camps in Yemen and other places are particularly vulnerable. And then we look at others who are incarcerated prisoners, the rates of, of COVID-19 and the lack of access to facilities across the world. This picture is taken from Latin America. So let's not forget the children. Let's not forget the prisoners. Let's remember the migrant workers. Many of you come from areas where you have seen this happen. These are Nepali migrant workers trying to get home from India. Sometimes uh, we can see examples of excellent practice. This is in uh, Northern Uganda and you can see the physical distancing as people are being supported with uh, food and practical substances. And let's not forget our elderly. This has been a devastating disease of the elderly uh, across the globe and that brings, brings particular ethical and care issues. Let us also not forget the many, many acts of kindness that we have seen and are seeing. And uh, these are ones that gladden the heart and encourage us as we see communities reaching out because in fact, community empowerment, community engagement is essential when handling something like a pandemic. And again, that is very strong in palliative care where we see the unit of care as the family and the community. It's important for COVID-19, Mariana has mentioned, because it's life-threatening mm -hmm. and puts people in isolation and possible stigma can happen. So we have got two words now, stigma and isolation already. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. 
This was quite striking. I'll just summarize it, but it was an article uh, written by um, a colleague in the US and she's not a palliative care doctor. And she was talking about how actually they felt like everybody was palliative care doctors now. And that fits with what we're saying. Palliative care is something that everybody can do, everybody must do, and we want to empower that. Because she was seeing a sense of helplessness that they couldn't reverse problems as they wanted to, and the need to preserve dignity, look at the issues of distress, existential uncertainty, that's spiritual issues. Look at the values of the patient and the priorities to look at them as an individual, to bear witness. And then she goes on to say, but isn't this the heart of good medicine, good clinical care? There's always something more to be done. And that is words that are music to the ears of us in palliative care. There's always something more to be done. And in particular, not let our patients feel abandoned. Mariana, you've already mentioned isolation. And in fact, in this uh, letter to The Lancet, some of us wrote after a uh, conference in Palestine where I've done some work and um, with amazing colleagues and partners there we, we, we touched on these words our common uh, humanity our sense of mortality that's been very clear hasn't it in COVID-19 the suffering that comes from that and our need to recognize our shared humanity and have a compassionate response that's all I wanted to say by introduction to palliative care Sunita do we have anything from the chat you want to summarize for me uh, yeah, nothing new. They've just mentioned about a few of them have contributed about the palliative care. So there are a few questions that I have also asked. Please think about that. Please think about the lockdown situation. When Moira showed the pictures of you know people waiting in queues, immediately I thought about the lockdown and how has that affected and how can palliative care sort of help with that. Uh, and also please think about the fact that if you don't normally look after palliative care patients, now in this scenario, when you suddenly have to look after people with palliative care needs, how do you adapt to that? So please have a think about that and please um, put in chat. I've also given you the link for the Lancet paper in case anybody wants to download that and read it. Um, Lovely. And have you been able to give us the link for the International Children's Palliative Care Network? I have done that. As yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah I have wonderful. done that. So each now of these sessions, that's introduction, each session is going to take a particular issue. And today's issue is quite a tricky one, triage and goals of care. So as we start to think about that, I just want to ask you that question, have you been involved in making these decisions about treatment choices for, for patients? If you have, please just share something of your experience here. So these are when we have to make a, an assessment of what the patient can, clinical condition is, but also whether or not we should escalate treatment. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of discussion. So please start to share your ideas as we get into this new topic, decision-making. Decision-making in and triage in COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned, we have more theoretical background in the webinars, particularly around the principles of medical ethics. Although I think you may remember the four pillars of medical ethics. If you do remember them, pop them into the chat. Um, but we're going to use those pillars, those frameworks, to help us look at clinical scenarios. How do we balance these important ethical issues? We're going to look at a triage and goals of care algorithm, and we're going to introduce a case narrative. All of this week, we will use the same case narrative. You will meet Mr. Ramesh and his family and see some of the problems that they're having. And as we do that, we'll think about how our values, our cultures impact on that. If you haven't downloaded the resource, here's another chance. And one more resource I suggest you use. This one only has adult uh, palliative care, the children's palliative care. We've shared the excellent site for that. But this is a very useful um, app, which is free on Android or Apple and gives you excellent symptom control advice. It's produced in Karanashria and is really quite excellent PalliCare app. Okay, on to ethical principles. Sunita, did we get any of them? Uh, Marianne has actually put it to me privately, so I'm encouraging her to put it out to everyone. Uh, Tell yeah. us then. Yeah, it's, it's autonomy, uh, justice, non-male physicians and beneficence. So I've asked her to put it to everyone. Wonderful. She's done that. Well, well done. She has. She has. So these ethical principles, they're not laws, and you do have to look at the legal framework in your setting. 
they're guiding principles, but it's very important to think through these issues. Otherwise, what we find is that we make decisions purely based on the situation in front of us. And that is called situational ethics. It's fraught with problems because these can be crisis situations. There can be a lot of emotions. And unless we think through these issues, it can cause us quite a lot of distress in. I mentioned already we need to balance that. What are the benefits of any intervention and the burdens? That's the non-maleficence and the, the beneficence. What is the wishes and best interest of the patient? Issues of autonomy. What are the perspective of the wider society and the resources available? Issues of justice. And how do we find that balance? And sometimes we find societies tend to say it's just the wishes of the patient. Others say it's just the wishes of the family. You can see the trouble. But I think we can find a way through this that um, helps the patient and family feel that we are on their side, that we're supporting them to make the best decisions for their families, while also being aware of the limited resources. It's a balancing act, but I hope it's not one that looks as impossible as this picture. And so we have this maze. How do we find our way through? And we're going to go step by step. We're going to use a patient scenario and narrative. And as we do that, I hope we'll begin to think, how can we answer some of these questions? Um, I've got a comment from um, Sujitra, Sujitra Rao, who has uh, commented about the lockdown situation. So lockdown had caused significant decline in admission of palliative care patients. All patients who are severely ill should receive equitable access to palliative care. So I think it's a very important point that you have raised. So I couldn't agree more. So that's why we were talking about COVID-19 infected, but also affected, because in fact, we're seeing many of our patients with comorbidities not getting the care they usually usually need. And that'll come up in our scenario too. We've got very vulnerable populations, a very unequal access to resources. Often in a pandemic situation, we are focusing on things like uh, testing on um, uh, ventilator numbers. And these are important, but we're not dealing with the holistic issues, with the stigma that you mentioned, with the language that we use, things like suspects. It's very difficult, isn't it? We're hearing that patients don't want to even go and be tested because of the stigma that may come to them. And um, we're hearing in India that the very fact that film stars are admitting their testing status is helping. And we saw this in the HIV pandemic in Africa too. Um, the, the relatively unexpected, although now we're having a bit more time prepare and of course extreme pressure. So let me introduce you to Ramesh. He's 75 years old. He has quite a number of comorbidities, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, obesity. You, you, you'll have seen recently just how significant a factor obesity is um, in this current pandemic. Hypertension with a stroke uh, six months ago. The stroke has left him with a dense hemiplegia and frequent chest infections. He's housebound and needs help with most daily tasks. He's cared for by his wife, his daughter-in-laws and his two sons. So that's just the bare bones. That's just the bare bones. But what we want to do uh, is to think about what are the issues in this scenario that are going to be relevant in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic time. So what are the issues in this scenario that are going to help us to move forward and make the best uh, choices for this family. Any suggestions on that? And over to you, Sunita, as well. Uh, so please think about this scenario and put it in the chat. Before we move on, I would like to uh, say one comment that Dr. Nikhil has made here. So he has said, I've been active in COVID-19 care at the tertiary hospital. The problems we are facing are insufficient resources in the form of intensive care beds, medications like remdesivir and tocilizumab, etc. Uh, due to sudden explosion of cases in the short time and we have patients who need care and are not able to get the care they need due to over flooding of hospitals and over exhaustion of medical staff. I think you've spoken for all of us Dr. Nikhil it's, it's exactly what we're all facing now in India and more, all the parts of India and thank you very much for that. Um, so, uh, and again, uh, not to forget the retroviral disease and tuberculosis, exactly. So uh, right from the beginning, we've been thinking about that, all the dengue cases, the TB cases, and all the other infections that we always have to face in India. Um, yeah, so uh, come back to Ramesh. Um, please look at Ramesh scenario, look at Ramesh comorbidities and think about the issues. Uh, and uh, Ramesh is a patient. So imagine that you're seeing Ramesh uh, in a ward and what are the issues that is going to help us decide the way forward regarding treatment interventions. And please put in chat.
I would like to request everybody who has some contributor in chat to say some words or something about what you think is going to affect Ramesh most or how do you think that Ramesh care, care should change. So please think about Ramesh. Lovely. And we have something already, the availability of resources. And I think you've mentioned the financial resources. And many times our ethical decisions are very limited by finances. Can I say, as, as you're putting in the various issues in this scenario, which are going to impact on our decision making, that this business of balancing scarce resources, I would say the countries you are all coming from, the settings you're coming from, is a daily reality. In some ways, some of the, the discussion around COVID-19 has been from high-income countries where they were not expecting these, these uh, if you like, uh, challenges of how, how to manage resources. So we already have skills in our settings, um, but as uh, Dr. Nikhil has saying, we're, we're overwhelmed at the moment. Any other suggestions about anything in this scenario that is going to help us decide the way forward? The financial setting we need to know about. Anything else that you're seeing in this? And while you're thinking, can I just mention that there's evidence coming from South Africa in particular that TB and HIV are independent factors um, for poor outcomes for COVID-19, mostly if the HIV uh, is, is not well controlled. Yeah, but it's very important we do remember those, those issues. We're not seeing so many answers now, so let's just move on, but please keep uh, feeling you can put it in. You don't have to, I'll just slightly say that, but it's lovely if you do, so we can get that interaction together. So I'm going to move on and we'll come back and we'll see what things we might have thought about. One of the things I want to ask you is, what, what is your feeling about how we are managing the elderly? Some studies have shown very low survival, as low as 11% for those having a mechanical ventilation who are elderly. I'll show you another study in a moment. In fact, I'll show you it just now. Here is a study which is suggesting that maybe th that uh, if you look at this corner here, that if you are older, then your chance of survival is much, much less. Can you see that? So this is the, the purple. The purple is showing those who have died in these settings. So it's showing that the elderly are much less likely to survive an admission to ICU. Does that mean we should say all the elderly should not be admitted to ICU? And does that mean that we might be writing off our elderly population by denying them treatment? What do you think? I'm seeing some, some really nice answers, answers, Sunita. You might want to summarize those. Yeah, please. Yeah, so physical uh, stress, mental stress. Uh, so Ramesh, bed mobility issues. Well done, drug run chest infections, uh, prevent aspiration, communication with family will be affected. Um, yeah, and the caregiver fatigue and for a long haul care uh, for the patient. Yeah. Great, these are great answers. So you're beginning to tell me that actually the pre-morbid situation here is the one we should focus on right now, uh, the pre-COVID rather. So you're wanting to look at maximizing his treatment for his existing comorbidities, absolutely. And you're wanting to look at what's happening with the family where many of us are feeling exhausted, aren't we? And of course our caregivers are feeling extremely exhausted. I'm seeing... I've got a re reply to the question that you asked Moira. So it shouldn't be the way. Elders shouldn't be written off. Everyone deserves the right to be cared for, even palliatively. Well done. Thanks for that, Evangeline. Elderly depends Great. on the So we've not to, not to write them life. off. Yeah. yeah. So we've not to write them off. Great. How are we to decide who we should ventilate and who we should not? Yeah. How are we to make those decisions? So we've, we're saying this is not true. We shouldn't write them off. And our colleagues in Italy, I think, panicked a bit at the beginning of this and wondered if there should be a cutoff with age. Okay, let's say there's no cutoff with age, but how do we decide? Any suggestions? So what are, all, what are the factors that you can think of uh, to decide? So if, if it's not the age, you forget about the age, but what else in Remes? Is there anything in Remes that you should be worried about? Well, we don't about? want to forget about the age, do we? We don't want to forget about the age, yeah, sure. but let's not make it an absolute yeah. cutoff. Yeah. Absolute cutoff. Yeah. Any suggestions? What things are going to help us in this patient scenario? to make some of these decisions. Don't worry if, if you don't know all the answers now, we're gonna work it through, but I want us to think it through initially. So we're saying age is not a absolute cutoff. So anything else in Dremage that you we're, think might- Lovely, you? thank you. So we're going to be looking at comorbidities, absolutely. And how many comorbidities do we say here? How many comorbidities are you seeing here? 
One, two, three, this one might be linked, four, five, yep. Excellent. So now we're looking at the functional and comorbid status of the patient alongside the age of the patient. So all of those factors are coming into play. And almost certainly that is what we are seeing when we look at studies like this uh, from the BMJ. We're seeing that there's a number of factors because if you're elderly, you're more likely to have comorbidities. You're more likely to have problems with your pre-morbid functioning. Excellent. Was there anything else on the chat there? Uh, so comorbidities, existing comorbidities. Daily living. Uh, daily living, yeah. Productivity. And productivity. Lovely. So let's take a few more steps on and see how we get, get on with that. This is a very nice document. If you want to look at these, these are global briefing notes that have been paired by all the global palliative care organizations. Many of us have contributed to them. This one is looking at ethics. And I just wanted to stop for a moment and remind us again of the ethical uh, frameworks. Non-abandonment, you brought that up right from the beginning. Of course, autonomy and all these other issues, but I want you to look at this, this one too, whole person care. So we balance all of these together to make the best decisions and we make sure the family know that we're working with them to make the best decisions. If you have a plan and a process in place, that's also going to help us to make the appropriate decisions. Because if you don't have a disease uh, escalation option, then that's going to, going to make a difference. This is Kerala showing some of the levels of care for, um, for uh, SP escalation and referral and many of these were worked out because of previous experience with the Nipah virus and with the floods and this shows an example of good practice. Of course every setting we hope are being putting into these things into their own practice. Before we make decisions we also need to be thinking about goals of care. Now this is not a very clear algorithm to, to read so I don't worry too much about the slides. Core to goals of care discussions are communication skills and that is the topic of um, a particular session, I think, in two days' time. But there's also other things we can take into a play. And you've mentioned some of them. The age, for sure. The number of comorbidities. You've told me about their functionality before, as well as the severity of the illness. So many of these things we can think about, we can even plan for. Are we having these conversations with our existing patients? Are we thinking about people like Mr. Ramesh, who are clearly in trouble already, and if COVID-19 was to be added to that, we would expect quite a poor outcome. So we can start having some of these conversations now. And we can start to begin to think, is this a situation where it's very straightforward and we go down the usual treatment guidelines and disease escalation referrals? Or is this a situation that is more complex and we actually should be having uh, conversations about expectations, um, about the, the likely outcomes, and beginning to discuss this further. That's what we would call a goals of care discussion. Now, I want you to help me with this one. This is uh, an algorithm that takes us through decision making. And it takes us through the green track, which is straightforward, and according to the local guidelines. It takes us through the yellow, which is where we have to start thinking, is there some other issues we ought to be addressing and discussing early? And the red track, where we've made a decision, the disease, that treatment escalation should not happen, and we should focus more on symptomatic and holistic care. And of course, at all points, we need to look at the holistic sides of care, and we'll do that as we go through the week. So let's take Mr. Ramesh. If we take him to the bottom, of, to the top of this picture, you can see that he is someone who has comorbidities. Yeah. So already we are, we're saying he's not in the yellow one because he has uh, the green one. He has comorbidities. So let's go down the yellow side. We're suggesting we use a tool to help us measure the functionality. And the one we're suggesting is a WHO tool. Some centers have used more complicated tools or tools more specific for elderly populations, um, such as the clinical frailty score or the organ frailty score. But if we just take this one, and I'm very well aware that we're talking about an elderly gentleman, and many of you are pediatricians, we are seeing palliative, we are seeing um, uh, significant illness in children, although the majority of children, COVID-19 is part of their illness uh, trajectory. It's not causing a severe illness, uh, may cause maybe identified along with other illnesses, but there are a small number who have predisposing um, complex needs or who are getting a Kawasaki type inflammatory response to COVID-19. But this is more particularly for our elderly patients. 
Does anyone know what the WHO status for this gentleman would be, the WHO performance scale? Well, we want to look at all of those things. And when we come down to that, we then think, okay, given all these things, having made a score, is this person appropriate for ventilatory support? And I want to ask you that question. Would you take Mr. Ramesh down the likely to benefit side or the unlikely to benefit side? So Nita, maybe you can summarize what people have been saying and see if we can answer that question. Do you think Mr. Ramesh is unlikely to benefit or likely to benefit if he gets severe respiratory symptoms with COVID-19? So you've got one answer, WHO three going to four. Uh, WHO score, yeah. Uh, I mean, Dr. Nikhil had uh, before put a comment about the elderly. Uh, so I feel our elderly have better health profile except for the aging process and strong willpower to fight the disease when compared to the present generation. Unless family members and other involved give up on them. Hence, they should not be left out. Okay. So just that one question from you. Can some of you just say yes or no? Would you, it's just... Do you think he's likely to benefit or unlikely to benefit? This particular gentleman, if he got severe symptoms of uh, respiratory failure and COVID-19. Likely or unlikely? Just give me one word. Likely or unlikely? Any suggestions? Likely or unlikely? You're thinking about it. Well, hold that thought. If even if it was difficult for aha, I see some answers coming unlikely. in. Unlikely. unlikely, unlikely. Okay. Yeah, unlikely. So Adelina is also unlikely to benefit. Adelina thinks it's guarded. Uh, yeah. Guarded. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So what I'm hearing from you, sorry, is you're beginning to say, okay, we're here thinking about this and we're maybe going down the red side. But we haven't ruled out this side, but we're maybe going down this red side. Absolutely. And we know that because of the extent of the comorbidities, the poor functioning, the, the, the scenario that we painted was of somebody very unlikely to benefit. And therefore, we're going to now have to have those conversations, honest, open conversations that involve prognosis, that don't give the impression that we're abandoning somebody because they're elderly alone, not at all. But the comorbidities and the lack of uh, pre-morbid functioning are going to be very significant. We're going to make, need to reach a consensus as the treating team, as well as communicate that effectively with the family and document our decision before we go down as far as moving the place of care. And remember, at any point, if someone improves or the situation changes, we can move into a yellow stream. Do you want to summarize for me what the chat is now, uh, Sunita? Um, it's all in unlikely. So because the chest is bad to begin with, so they think it's, uh, it's unlikely that he's going to benefit. Lovely. So you've made an appropriate ethical decision. We've made it together as a multidisciplinary audience. Then the challenge, of course, is to communicate that effectively. So thank you for that. So you've just shown how, in fact, we can do this. Yeah. That doesn't mean the next step is not tricky, the communication, but we can first of all communicate and document amongst ourselves as healthcare professionals, bring in colleagues if we need to, if it's particularly tricky, try and make sure this is an ethical and clinical decision making process, not one simply based on, on uh, resources, unless those resources really are not available. And remember futility. That is when we say that the benefit, that the likely benefits are outweighed by the almost certain harms, and we shouldn't push those treatments. But what we should do is actively treat and actively manage that scenario uh, with the appropriate symptomatic and holistic interventions. And these will include refractory symptoms, end of life care, and perhaps appropriate referral. Thank you for those of you who got the WHO score right. It's relatively straightforward, one to four, and you're right, this gentleman is three, possibly four, depending on how much he can do for himself. That's quite severely affected. Here's that other tool I mentioned. This is a clinical frailty score. This gentleman would score probably six or seven, which is severely unwell. And this score also allows for a terminal illness, a very short prognosis illness to be recognized. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else from our chat, Sunita? No, nothing new. Lovely. So great.